get. So we start recording the presentation from now. And I'm going to share my screen. So thanks everyone. And thank you to Creative Ireland program and EPA Research. And of course, the company I work for, South Kerry Development Partnership, for getting all of these workshops off the ground and going. So just to tell you a little bit to start off with about the Kerry Biosphere Reserve, which is a UNESCO designated biosphere reserve. And my own name, of course, is Eleanor Turner, and I am the biosphere officer. So I'm only just in the job, just a couple of months. So we're getting going with a few of these projects at the moment. So what are biosphere reserves? Well, biosphere reserves are places of learning for sustainable development. And when we talk about sustainable development, we're not just talking about protecting nature, but we're also talking about the economy and how people interact with nature as well. So we, we like to say that there are places where nature and culture interact or intersect. And what does the word UNESCO mean? So UNESCO is very simply the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. So that is the United Nations body that awards the Biosphere Reserve designation. And just recently, I think there was 21 new Biosphere Reserves announced worldwide, and there's only two in Ireland in total. So the Kerry Biosphere Reserve, which is found here around the lakes and mountains in the middle of Kerry. And there's the Dublin Bay Biosphere Reserve as well over on the East Coast. So the Kerry Biosphere Reserve, you can see a little better map of it here. Biosphere Reserves have three different areas. So the core area, is in the centre here, and that is really the full extent of Clarny National Park. The core areas are always kind of protected areas for nature and conservation, and that will be the main focus in those areas. Then when you move out to the buffer zone, which is this RNG area here, you start to see where people are using sustainable land management practices and interacting with their environment in a positive way. And then in the transition zone is where you start to see a lot more human activity. And this is where we start to look at how can economics and recreation support the work that's happening in the core area of the Biosphere Reserve and engage the people that are living in that area as well. So this is just another example of the core areas, the buffer zone and the trans transition zone. And you can see how it goes from being quite a nature focus in the center out to how do we start to encourage the human activity on the outside in a sustainable way. So now I'm going to introduce our workshop facilitator today, Alana Nikanik. I am delighted to introduce her because she's a fantastic educator. She is an outdoor environmental educator with a cross-curricular approach to learning and she has an MSc in outdoor environmental sustainability education, which is quite a fantastic thing to have. So thank you so much for joining us today, Alana, and um, I'll hand over to you now. So I'm just going to stop screen sharing. All right, can everybody hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Grant. Yeah. Okay, great. So my name is Alana, as Eleanor said, and I'm an educator in Kerry. I'm from Meath originally, so that's what the accent is, but I've been here several years now, so and I plan to stay here as well. So <laughs> um, being part of the biosphere is an absolutely amazing way to live in Ireland, so I can't recommend it enough. And I hope to share some of what I've learned over the last few years and from what I've previously studied as well today. Um, usually I would be one for experiential learning, so um, that would be taking you out in the biosphere to let you walk and run around and experience things hands on. So it's difficult with COVID to do those kind of things, but I will try to make this workshop today as interactive as I possibly can. So one of the things that I was trying to do when I was coming up with this workshop was what can people do within their five kilometres, because as we are now, we're we're a bit stuck. Not everyone can get to the National Park, not everyone can get to a woodland, so I hope that um, you can use what I, what I show you today in your own local area. So if you're anywhere in Kerry, anywhere in Ireland or beyond, if you have any trees on your street, if you have any woodlands within your five kilometres at all, I'm sure there's things to be found and learned in there. So I'll try to share some trees with you. Um, we're going to focus on native trees today. And the reason for that is that they support more other wildlife than naturalized or invasive trees and, and other plants. So while naturalized trees might have been here for several hundred years, and they're very welcome, the likes of beech, for instance, they make beautiful forests and some of the national parks, some of the biosphere reserve has a lot of naturalized trees. But just if people are interested in planting these trees that we go through today, 
I definitely recommend going for some of the originals. So what we'll start with, are, um, I have sent you out a questionnaire in advance, so I hope you were able to find that. Um, it should be in an email that you received earlier today. So if you want to open that up and have it in another tab, if you don't have it printed, that's fine. And it'll just help you to work on your own um, awareness, I suppose, um, for the future. Whenever you're outside, things will be jumping out at you now that you might not have even noticed before. So because of the difficulty with Zoom and screen sharing and things like that, I've put up these videos on YouTube in advance. So what I'll do is I'll share my screen and hopefully we'll be able to watch one video of a different tree at a time. So I'll share my own screen and play a video, but I'll also just in advance, will send you the link. So I'm just gonna get that up now, the link to the first one. And I'm gonna put that in the chat so that you can, you can go and just follow that link to the YouTube video if the share screen isn't working well, if the quality is too bad or something. So here's the link for the first YouTube video. I'm just gonna share my own screen now as well. And this one go. All right now. As with many outdoor educators and people who enjoy the natural world, technology is not my forte. <laughs> I'll try my best today. Okay, so hopefully you can see this now. This is one of the most important trees in Irish folklore. So, Think about what you notice about this tree. First of all, I'll show you and then I'll point out what I see. Right, so the first thing I think when I see this is that it's really big and that it's quite gnarly looking. Like the bark, I don't know if you can see that. I'll try and zoom in. So the bark is quite knotty and gnarly and it's got lots of bends and twists in it and quite a lot of side branches, like strong side branches. When I look down here then it's got ivy all up the trunk and ivy is very often a partner with this tree. And then I look around at the leaves that are on the ground around here. So you can figure out what it is. So here's another big one as well. So you can see that they have these lobes, they're called. And the lobes are quite shallow. They don't go in that deep to the, towards the center. So that would give me an idea that it is a sessile oak. There's two different types of oaks in Ireland. We have pedunculate oak and sessile oak. One of the big differences is that this one has only shallow lobes. The, the pedunculate oak, they go in much further towards the center line. There's the cup. Here's the main car. Right, so this is the time of year when these are falling off all over the place. And you might see big rackets with, cr with uh, crows flying around, flapping madly. They're after these as well, and they tend to drop them all over the place, which actually does the oak tree a great deal. Um, because they're trying to spread their acorns as wide as they can. 
So this is a great year for, for oak and often they'll have some quiet years where they don't have that many acorns and this just seems to be a crazy productive year for them. So if you would like to further native Irish trees and are looking for something to do during the lockdown then what you can do is collect these and I'd, re I'd recommend just choosing a few. They are being put out by the tree for a reason, they're trying to repopulate. Um, so if you just take one or two, take them home, gather up some of this leaf litter it's called, or if you have any leaf litter in your own garden that will work just as well. And a combination of soil covered with this leaf litter, and if you keep them in a pot with that covering until springtime, then you will have a baby oak tree. I hope that that was clear to everyone. Just let me know if, if you have any trouble with the quality of those videos. Um, so just as I said in that video, native seeds, this is the time for them. And we happen to be in a situation where we can't go very far and you might have more time to give to your garden or to learning about these things. So if you can get outside the rest of today and find some seeds on the, on the paths around or in any woodland nearby. So if I were to ask, and I'd like you to be as active as you can in the, in the chat, just to make this a bit more interactive. In Kerry, would you say that we have more sessile or pedunculate oak based on what was in that video? So we know that um, the sessile oaks prefer well-drained, but maybe hilly terrain, and that they are fine with acidic soils. Whereas the pedunculate oak, like more moderate alkaline soils, and they, they are better in, in kind of lowland, not well-drained areas. So if you want to just have a go in the chat and guess which one we have more of in Kerry, and particularly in the biosphere reserve. I'm going to come in there. Um, more of sessile, we think. Um, Breed thinks sessile as well. And Patricia Holbin is saying sessile too. Are we, are we right? Are we on the right track, Lana? <laughs> Absolutely on the right track. So because of the soil types and the rock types that we have in Kerry, it tends to be more sessile that we have. Um, so Devonian rocks, which are sandstone, are the oldest rocks around in this area, and they lead to an acidic soil type. So what I would say is that, and I learned this from a mentor of mine, that we don't do anything with the rocks. We resign ourselves to the, our, ourselves to the rocks and everything that we do, we might not think it, but everything that we do and everything that grows in this area is dependent on the original rocks from thousands of years ago. So the sandstone rock underlies much of Kerry and that leads to acidic soil and that leads to sessile oak trees. So the next one we're going to do, I'm just going to share it as well. And do let me know if the videos are not working because I think that would be lousy. <laughs> The last, the last one showed fine anyway, so we could see, <laughs> okay. see it fine. Oh, we could hear it fine too, so no worries so far. <laughs> link if you want to go through YouTube. So we're here looking at an ivy plant. So this ivy, as you can see, grows out from the base of the tree and it climbs up a tree trunk. It has what are called rootlets and they 
latch onto a tree's trunk. They don't actually damage the tree in any way. And they draw their own water and minerals from the ground the same as the tree does. And they bring it up towards their leaves. They make their own food through photosynthesis. Photosynthesis from their own leaves. And there's a lot of variety in ivy leaves. So some of them can have this three pointed look. And some of them are more oval this one. So it can be hard to identify them just from looking at a leaf. But you can see that the way they climb up the, the branches of virus trees are, are dead giveaway. And these are really, really important. And I think we generally undervalue ivy and how it contributes to, to wildlife. It is, it has flowers, yellow flowers until let's say October, even some places it goes until November. The flowers have been finished on this tree. But once the flowers are gone, they leave bees, and if they're fertilised, bees will develop into berries. So if you want to look closer, you can see that some of them have already swollen up. You can see here they're getting bigger, and they'll develop into berries that are a dark colour, um, black looking berries. And those berries will be an incredibly important food source for birds through the winter. Um, it has already helped bumblebees, hoverflies, some species of butterfly which are which continue on until the autumn like the peacock butterfly the red admiral they all use the flowers of ivy and by this time of year it's used as a food source for blackbirds nipple thrushes um, wood pigeons so they all use this very through the winter because there isn't much around another type of animal that greatly depend on ivy are bats so we have 10 species of bat in ireland and of those, five of them roost in trees. So they can use holes or crevices, split branches in trees, but they also can roost behind dense ivy. So it's got double benefits for the bats because firstly, it has evergreen leaves that give them shelter from the elements all through the winter. And secondly, ivy grows on native trees, which tend to support more insect life than others. And that means that the bats have greater food source during the winter. Now they do hibernate, so they reduce their heart rate and they eat less and they go out less. But they do during mild days during the winter, go out and hunt. And on those days, they have most food availability by being um, on ivy on native trees. So one particular species um, is best known for, for using ivy and using trees to roost, and that's the brown long-eared bat. So I'm sure they and all of the other species mentioned be grateful if we, if we left some ivy around on the native trees. After that, did anyone, had anyone thought that ivy had any benefits or was it just a damaging thing for trees? Because I hear a lot that people say that ivy damages trees and it pulls down trees. The only damage that it can do is if, if a tree isn't very strong or if it's weakened or, or old, then in high winds, the weight of the ivy on, on the top of the tree, if it's very heavy, can make it more likely that the tree will be knocked down. That's the only, the only way it really damages the trees. Um, but yeah, it has massive benefits for wildlife and especially in the winter because we go through, if you imagine you're a bird, we go through the different seasons where they move from black blackberries and then they go on to holly berries and then they, there's nothing in January, February. So it's then that the ivy really comes into its own. So if you have some around, have a look out for all the insects on it and all the birds that are using it at this time of year and then look out as well for butterflies in the summer. So we'll go on to the next one. Just a few comments come in there about, about the Ivy video saying like, oh, we never knew Ivy was so useful. And wow, that, that I didn't know that. That's a great presentation. So I feel the same. I think I always had the, the preconception that Ivy was really damaging, like it was taking food from the tree. But you've said that's not the case, right? That's not the case. So if you had a 
particularly June A3 would say, and the ivy was very vigorous, then it, it could be possible that the ivy would get up so big that it would cover the leaves of, of the tree that it's on. But it's very unlikely because most, because an ivy wants a good strong tree to hold onto. So it usually goes for trees that already are very vigorous and have a lot of photosynthesis going on. So if, as long as the tree, the supporting tree's leaves are uncovered and able to get the sunlight, then the ivy isn't damaging them in that way. All right. Totally changed my view on ivy now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> my job here is done for the day. <laughs> I'm not sure, am I sharing my screen yet? No, I'm not. Okay, here we go. So. so this is a hazel tree. And we know it's hazel because this gives it away, all of these stems. It's a multi-stem tree. So that means that these will keep growing back. If you cut it, and it's called coppicing. So if you cut it right back to the base, if we cut this whole tree off, it would still grow back with these little stems on top. And you often see that in older forests where people have been using the same trees for generations, they'll coppice it every, three, every few years to get a new lot of hazel stems. Because these stems, when they're about this thickness, are really bendy, but at the same time very strong. So they were used for, as they wattle and daub, um, so making fences, making structures, and um, they're really useful along with willow for, for making boundaries basically. Um, they're getting a bit ragged now because it's in autumn. Okay. So this one here, you can see around the outside it's very toothed. So these teeth, jagged edges. At the same time it's quite round, it's not a skinny leaf, and it's very furry. So underneath as well, it has a feeling like velvet. So they're, they're quite hairy leaves. And the seeds at this time of year, the seeds of the hazel tree, you know, are hazelnuts. So hazelnuts are edible for people as well as animals. This tree seems to be a very particular favorite of mice and squirrels. Okay, so here, originally when the seeds fall down, fall down in these tufty little seed cases and this has two seeds in it. So the seed will look like this and it will fit into this case. And this is the way it looks when it hangs on the tree but greener at first. And it turns brown and it drops off. So it like, looks like this and this is a very hard outside shell and it needs to be cracked. So all of these here are potential have potential seeds inside. Not all of them will be viable, so some feel a bit lighter than others. And that might be that it's just an empty case, there's no actual seed inside it. Others will have seeds inside, and by now the squirrels and mice usually have found those ones. So, like so this, this is very recently done. You see, it's been chewed apart, but the seed has been taken out of the case. are all still potentially viable so we'll leave them back for mice and squirrels to have for their winter store unless you're going to plant some in your garden in which case I'd take maybe one or two because they are sustaining animals during the winter time so only collect seeds if you really intend on growing them in your garden if, if you're just going to collect them in a plastic bag and let them rot it would be a, a very big waste so we leave these back for now I'm just going to show you one more thing. So this is a hazelnut that we found on the ground. And if they're left to grow on the ground, if it's not eaten by a squirrel or a mouse or collected by people, it'll do this by itself on the forest floor. It'll split open and grow a little root or what's called a radical. And that will burst out at the end of the seed and because it's in amongst the leaf litter and the muck that's decayed leaf litter, it'll shoot this root down into the ground first. And then when that's got a good strong hold, it'll shoot a shoot up through the, 
through the soil and we'll get a new hazel tree. So you can see around this tree here, it has lots of its own stems. We have some potential baby hazels. These here, they've already lost their leaves. But I would say that they are coming from seeds just like this one. And they've already grown to this height. So that's the, the hazel tree. And these are a great tree to plant if you want to grow something in your garden. If you want to grow some native, some native trees but you don't have a lot of space maybe. The hazel, you know that you can, it's, it can grow big like this one. But you can keep coppicing it and you can keep it quite small with stems just this thickness. And it will survive and it will thrive like that anyway. Has anyone got any hazel trees in the garden? Can I just ask? Or any likely? I'm I'm literally five minutes from um, Derry Nan Wood, so I I remember picking up hazelnuts down there as a kid. So there's definitely some around Cara Daniel, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> There are actually um, a lot in Bally CD was as well for anyone who's living near Tralee. Bally CD is a great place for hazel and that's where I took that video. Um, so some of my videos have been done outside of the, the biosphere as well because of the 5k <laughs> and in the last week there's been storms and everything so the amount of video content that I have of me unfortunately poor Theresa Mannion I know all too well what she went through being battered around in the storms and um, <laughs> so it's so difficult for filming for sure doesn't it <laughs> yeah. we have a few people have dropped in there Eileen Kennedy has said she doesn't know she'll have to go and check now she knows what she's looking for and Fergus O'Donoghue who has said yes quite a few including a few twisted ones if they count <laughs> so it's it's even better if you if you're trying to plan something if you look around your local area and um, even if they're not in your garden if it grows outside nearby you, it generally means that the soil type around you would be suitable for that tree. So like you say, there's woods nearby and there's hazel in it and there's woods nearby me, that would indicate that they're probably gonna do all right in our gardens, unless there's a massive soil change between the, <laughs> between us and the neighbor in, and the local area. So they're a great one to have in your garden. And that, that seed that I showed in the video that has the little radical escaping from the nut, I'm going to show you after the break how you might plant a seed like that. And even if it, even if it has no radical, I'll show you how we might do a practical thing like that, as long as the rain holds up. So we'll just move on. One now. question has come in there, um, Alana, about coppicing. They said, if you keep coppicing the tree, will it still grow hazelnuts? But it needs an adequate amount of time between cuttings. So usually I think it's left five to seven years between between coppicing it back to the base to get those type of rods. And if you if you want more hazelnuts, it needs to be left longer basically. Um so yeah, if you maybe get it to a size that you like and then and then cut it every so often. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go on to the next video. The reason I'm going through these couple of different trees is that they, they are all suitable for different areas. So the hazel might like a slightly wetter soil. We'll go on to another one now in a minute that, that likes a really wet soil. So during the break, you might go out to your garden and have a, have a look at what's in there and see if you can see what you might choose to put in and what might be most successful for your area. I can see a couple of trees that are the same around here. Here's a closer one. Let's see if you can guess what these are. The leaves are still on this. I'll give you a look at the trunk as well. You can see it's quite smooth.
So, these leaves tell me that this is an ash tree because these leaves are small leaflets in pairs opposite one another. Two native Irish trees that have this. One of them is the ash and the other is the rowan or mountain ash. So we know this is an ash because it has wider leaflets. It's more like a spear shape. And rowan has skinnier ones. Rowan also has red berries. Whereas ash doesn't, it has keys that we look, look at it closer again. So we know this is an ash tree. And ash is traditionally used in Ireland for making pearlies. It's really strong but also really flexible wood, which is what you want if you're going to be fitting this with it. Um, oh yeah, if later on when this when this tree loses its leaves totally, can you see that way? You can see. So even when these are all gone, we can still tell that it's ash because it has these black tips of buds. This is an ash tree that's a branch that's fallen off a bigger tree, but it allows us to see the keys up close. So this is their seed. They jangle like a set of keys and they fall off that way as well in the wind. And if we take one off here. So they have these kind of flappy case that it carries it down in the wind and disperses them. But then if I break it apart down near the base, it has this tiny flat seed inside. So that's the ash seed and it's coming from the inside of an ash key. So if you find a bunch of keys like this and it's coming from a healthy ash tree so we can have a look at where it came from that ash tree over there you can see all above us are the keys dangling down so they produce a massive amount of them now this doesn't happen every year some years are more productive than others so this is a very good year for ash and for oak so it's the perfect year to be collecting some seeds and trying to grow them yourself There's no sign of disease on that tree, so I'd be happy to, to collect a few of the seeds and to grow from them. Uh, our ash population has really been decimated in recent years by ash dieback disease. So if you do find a healthy ash tree um, that has seeds on it or has keys on it, it would be really nice to collect them and if you have space for an ash tree in your garden to grow that so we can try and improve their population again. So something to mention about the ash tree is that unfortunately we have had ash die back in the country since 2009 I think it was. So it's one to consider before you plant because on the one hand there are estimates that we could lose 85% of ash trees to this disease and um, over the next 10 years or so I think. So at the moment Chagask and the Department of Agriculture are looking into how we can select genetically for ash trees that are resistant to it and um, but they estimate that between 2 and 15 percent of ash trees might be resistant so we can take a chance and try to plant them and hope that we happen to get one that will be resistant and certainly the more ash trees that there are the more chance that they there will be some that develop resistance because each and indiv each individual tree um has basically reacts to the environment differently. That's why they, they cross pollinate. So, um, so it's a choice basically. Do you want to build up the ash population in the knowledge that we're going to lose a lot of them anyway? Or should we leave them go, accept that the disease is here and try to repopulate the woodlands that we have with other native trees? So either way, we have to plant a lot of native trees to make up for the loss because um, ash is one of our, our most common trees. So what I would say, just because we've been sitting still a long while now, if you have any children, if you are a child or if you just want to get up onto your feet, I would say take two minutes and just run outside, see if you can pick up a seed, any seed and bring it back in with you 
and then tell me what you what if you know what it is and if not describe it and whether you think it would be an animal that disperses that seed or the wind so just take two minutes and come back and fill in in the chat if you if you find anything great So we'll just take the two minute break then and then we'll hop back. We do have one question here from Patricia's kids. Said they, so can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh yeah, so um, I see, um, I thought the helicopters were from Sycamore. That's from Patricia's kids. Yeah, helicopters are from, C from Sycamore. Ash keys look very similar to helicopters. So it looks, a, an ash key looks like one side of a Sycamore's helicopter. They're very, very similar looking. And the reason for that is that they both use the same trick to get dispersed. So if you want to be dispersed by the wind, you need to be small, you need to be very light. So that's why the inside of the ash um, key, the seed was really, really thin and light in comparison to the likes of the hazelnut, for instance. So it's aiming for a different thing. It's aiming for how light can I be so that the wind will pick it up and carry it as far from the parent tree as it can. So both sycamore and ash use that trick and they just look the same because of it. Great stuff. Thanks so much, Alana. So if everyone's happy to spin out to their garden and see what they could find and we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. So Patricia's kids have got acorns and it looks like they have thousands of acorns fine so <laughs> good luck to the squirrels around your area. <laughs> I'd say your your kids are the best squirrels around Patricia. That's amazing that you've that you've planted so many. It's fantastic. Where was that that you that you planted them? So the I'm trying acorn. to think off the top of my head what's outside my own house here and <laughs> I know we have some ash trees and we actually have a lot of sycamore trees too so uh, I think that's mostly what's in my garden. Oh, the wind is burst, trees are in. <laughs> um, so actually I was thinking um, it's a good idea to think about because we're talking about planting seeds think about what size a tree, a tree might grow to. So the acorns that you guys have planted I'm sure with so many of them, you must have had a big area to put them in. I know that my own garden isn't big enough for an oak tree. There is one over the wall and it's actually dropped some of its own acorns in next to the oil tank and they've started shooting up right beside the oil tank. So if anyone would like to adopt an oak tree, I'm going to have to move them to, to a larger home. <laughs> so just if you'd like to volunteer yourself to adopt an oak tree that's maybe a year or two old, um, I would be happy to drop it off to you. 
Oh, fantastic. So Eileen has Holly, Whitethorn and Mountain Ash around. It's fantastic. Holly is looking amazing at the moment. There's lots of the, the berries out on the holly already. It looks, uh, looks Christmassy a bit early, but <laughs> it looks really Christmassy. <laughs> Great year for oaks, so I'm glad to see that the Pate and Trisha have both got acorns. Um, that's brilliant. It's lovely to see the oaks taken up because they are um, known as the king of the, the woodland. So the, the native trees were divided into in folklore into the nobles of the wood and the commoners of the wood. And there was a different punishment under Brehan law if you were to take down one of those trees. Um, because they are considered so vital to the economy. And what you were saying earlier, enemy, or, uh, earlier Elner, about, um, about the different parts of the economy, um, the trees are considered so vital at that time that you would be punished by having to pay a fine of two and a half uh, cows if you took down an ash or an oak tree, the nobles of the wood. And if you took down something like a birch, you would have to pay the fine of one cow. So in, in financial terms nowadays, that's a massive amount of money. So, um, so be yes. careful. <laughs> Maybe we should bring a system like that back to help our trees a little bit. <laughs> we'll start charging people a whole cow if they do any damage to them. <laughs> Definitely keep, keep some of our woodlands then. <laughs> There's some great information I know from, from LEAF and Kerry Earth Education about how to start a tree nursery. If anyone wants to look that up online, they have a fantastic free resource. Um, and she said she planted a lot up a mountain between the rocks. That's great. Okay, so especially the sessile oaks, like I was saying, they like mountainous areas. So if you know the, the gap of Dunlow well, you'll notice that there's certain trees that that live in there, in that area, because it's quite poor soil in most areas. So we have the sessile oak down the bottom where there's more glacial deposits. And then further up, there's aspen and there's more holly. Um, so we'll just move on to the next video, I think. Let's keep things moving on. Oh yeah, I'll just, just get the link for you. where you could look up starting a nursery. R-E-A-F, Leaf Food Resources. And the other one, it, it's a fantastic resource, is Kerry Earth Education. Kerry Earth Education. Okay, I'll, I'll try and find the links and I'll drop them into the chat so everyone can follow up on those. get the share screen up again. This is a very wet day. <laughs> so, this is Alder. This is actually a great day for Alder, as you can see. We're in Blarney National Park and there's flooding. The water level is over in the base of the tree. So this really suits alder because alder is a water loving tree. Um, you can identify it by these really wide leaves and they have a small nick in the top of them. And then they grow these and seeds. So they're a deciduous tree but they still have cones and that's really unusual. Usually it's conifers like pine that have that have cones like this, but this is an alder cone and this is where they store their seeds. There's a lot of lichen growing on alder trees. So you've just seen over the far side a whole area of alder and every one of them is covered in lichen. So lichen is this stuff here, it kind of looks like a fungus. It's actually An algae to the lichen to a fungus, that's how I remember it anyway. And this is a symbiotic relationship, so they can't 
different foods for now, one another. Um, and they they live on the surface of the tree, they don't do any harm to the tree either. And they're used in a lot of foundations to like medicines and for dyes. So they're really important. Um, yeah, the wood of alder. So as you can see, the water is right up around this tree and all of these alders here. And that's fine with it because it's it's really resistant to rotting. So alder is usually used if there is if you're building a pier or anything that's going to be submerged in water. And even Venice was originally built mainly on alder. Um, so so it's really resistant to rotting. That's a good thing to know if you're a carpenter. So, sorry about the same quality there, as you might imagine, it wasn't easy to film. <laughs> and that wasn't the worst take either. Um, so, I hope at the moment that no one's garden is as flooded as the National Park was that day last week. But if you do have wet ground in your garden, then alder might be the tree for you. Um, so, as it said, it's antimicrobial and it, um, and it grows well, it's resistant to rot. So just bear that in mind if you have maybe a back corner of your garden or something that's prone to flooding, it can be a nice tree to have. Um, so I maybe I'm thinking about getting back into the clogs myself, what with the amount of flooding around in the park. I hadn't actually realised they were made of alder, but they're seeming more and more practical. You could probably order a shipment to Cork at the moment. Yeah, it might be a good tree to start planting alongside our rivers where we're having all of our flooding issues. <laughs> if anyone knows the National Park well, you might you might remember that there's an area along what's usually called the moat of Ross Castle. Um, so from the bridge that's going out the side of the island, there's a lot of alder along there and they, they totally line the banks of it and all around the care park there as well. And so that's an area that's prone to flooding. So the alders have and um, basically thrive in those areas. So yeah, the more alder we can get holding the banks together along the rivers, the better, I think. Now, at the moment, it's a little bit late for the alder seeds. If you wanted to grow them yourself, you can have a look on, on the alder trees. But what you're looking for with these is still for there to be green cones. So once they turn brown like that, they've, they've essentially split open and the seeds will have dropped out. So you want the green ones that haven't yet dried out. Um, if you want to, if you want to plant them, but they do take a long time because they've to they take about eighteen months for the seeds to to stratify it. So, yeah, so so they're not a quick turnaround tree. But if you if you just find some green cones and you have a wet corner of your garden, just try them. There's no harm in in putting them in the ground, seeing if anything happens from it. So we'll move on now to I think it might be the last tree. I want to go into detail of and then we'll, then we'll have a break and then we'll do something practical after. Oh, sorry, I don't know how to get out of this video now. Sorry about that, the elder video didn't want to stop sharing. Okay. This is a very interesting native tree that we have. I'll just give you a second to see if you can identify it. So it has these shiny, waxy leaves. They're very smooth around the edges. If I were to tell you that this is the same tree as, let's say, this is. These are, might give it away. So this is a holly tree and this is more of what we expect a holly, a holly leaf to look like. The spikes around the edges. But really these spikes are just a defense mechanism that the holly tree uses. They're not always there. So this particular tree 
is very big for a holly tree. It's a substantial looking tree. So by this stage, it doesn't need to be as protective of itself. So even though its lower leaves are, are still quite spiky, the upper ones, as you can see these that are hanging down from above, there's hardly any spikes on those because there's no need for it. They're, in Ireland anyway, there's no animals that are going to be able to reach up that high for those leaves. And it's important that Holly does this because it's after putting a lot of effort into keeping that waxy coat on its leaf surface and that keeps the water in. So they're actually really tasty, full of water for animals. Just to show you, because I've spotted a baby Holly. It's got very spiky leaves. So it's only it's only a hand's length really, so that could easily be wiped out in one go by a deer. So they have to protect themselves at that stage. And similarly, this tree is older. It's It's got a very thick stem, but it's been chopped by people. So when that happens, when it's cut back like that, it'll respond by getting even more defensive. So you can see this tree has incredibly spiky leaves. And that's the same if holly is grown in a hedgerow and, it, and it's cut back every year, it'll just be more defensive. So that's why they're the more typical leaves that you might see and identify with holly. An important thing to know about the holly tree is that it's dioecious. Dioecious means that it has separate male and female trees. So some trees have both male and female flowers on the one tree, whereas the holly has separate female trees that have female flowers and berries and male trees that just have male flowers. So if you want to grow a lovely native holly tree in your garden and you want those lovely red berries every Christmas, you want to make sure that it's a female tree that you have in the garden and that there's a nearby male tree. If you have a male tree within 200 meters of your female tree, the bees will make sure that 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 tree is pollinated for you. So the bees are supported by the trees in that they get nectar from the from both male and female holly flowers and then the trees are supported by the bees because their pollen is being transferred, they become fertilized and the female trees can then grow their red berries. And then the birds such as the blackbird and the missile thrush, the song thrush and wood pigeons very similar to ivy eat those berries and depend upon them and spread the, spread the holly seeds around for the holly tree. What I would suggest at this time of year is holly being the best um, tree to try to grow yourself. So holly can be grown from cuttings rather than seeds. It's quite difficult to grow holly from seeds just because um, the berries actually prevent the seed from germinating too early and they're designed to be passed through the digestive system of the birds before they can grow in the ground. So for that reason it's easier to take cuttings and this is the perfect time of year to do it. Now I'm looking to make a cutting from a stem that's at least the thickness of a pencil but that I can still cut through with my secateurs. So I think this is the one here that I'm going to go for. I also need some side shoots like these. And I want to cut above, you can see a side shoot here. I'm going to cut just above that. And I'm going to cut below another one. Going to cut off the side shoot. Okay, and I'm going to take this home to plant as a cutting. So this is my male holly cutting. Okay, and here we are, just 100 meters down the path. You can see the beautiful red berries of a female holly. 
So I'm going to take a cutting. Again, I'm looking for one that's at least pencil thickness. I want to cut below a side shoot. I wanted to make sure to get some berries on there as well and I'll shorten it down till it's just about 30 centimetres and below a leaf. So taking one little stalk like that from a, from a fully grown holly tree like this one won't do any harm to it because it's the correct time of year to do this. So you want to do it during the winter where the tree, even though it's an evergreen, it does get slightly harder, the stems harden, so it's the perfect time to do this and it's less likely to, to get a fungus or for any disease to get into the end that you've cut. So does anyone have any questions about any of the, the things that were covered in the video so far? No? So, just um, with the um, when you're cutting when you're cutting the stems, why are you like going below uh, a side shoot and a uh, just below another side shoot at the top? What's the reason for the side shoots? And it just tends to make the plant more vigorous when it's when it's growing back. So you want um, basically you don't want to go through one of those offshoots. It's just it's diff more difficult for the for the plant to get out of the top of the stem if there's a kind of a division, we'll say, between between buds or between um, between branches. So you want to make sure it's not in the middle of a joint, and it's, it helps if you have some within the, the cutting that you're taking. So it's it's a good idea to make sure you have a leaf too, and that's why I do that. Perfect. And how? So you said this is the perfect time of year for taking a cutting on a holly tree. Um, <laughs> When's like when does that perfect time of year start and when does it end? Like how long into the year would you be doing that and when should you be stopping and letting it recover and start to grow again in spring? Um, I wouldn't do it if there's new growth on on the trees. So essentially, when when the berries are gone, when the winter when it's coming to the end of winter, it starts warming up. I wouldn't take any cuttings after that because the branches will soften up again. So it's coming into the coldest time of year we're going to get some cold weather and frost soon so essentially when winter starts and when it ends that's when you want to be doing what are called hardwood cuttings. Perfect and there's another question that's come in there in the chat from Mary Jo Quigley what medium will you plant the cuttings into into a pot or earth or how do you do it? So I would put them into a pot myself because I just want to do the two cuttings. I just want to do one male and one female at the moment. So I'll do them in a pot and I'll show you how to do that later on after the break. Um, but another way that you can do it, which I won't go into at the moment, is you can dig a trench if you just want to put them directly into the ground. If you want to, for instance, have a whole hedge of holly, you could take cuttings from different trees. You, grow it, uh, you cut down a trench with a vertical side and, a, and an angled side, and then you put the cuttings down the inside of the straight vertical side of the trench. And then you fill it in with, you can put in a mixture of so just soil from the garden and compost. Um, if you can, you would put sand along the bottom of the, of the trench because holly does like well-drained soil. And when they're cuttings especially, you don't want them to become waterlogged so disease could end up going up the, the end of it. So you want to keep it very well drained and it helps if you have sand in the bottom for that. So if you, I, I bought a bag of sand the other day, you can get it in any hardware shop. You just ask for either children's play sand or horticultural sand. And it's just sharp enough that it allows the, the water to drain out the bottom. And of course, actually, if you want to put leaf litter or leaf mould in there as well, that's the ideal type of medium. So that's what they're growing in in the forest. If you have some leaf mould, which is just broken down leaf litter, if you have some of that already, just mix it in with the compost or the soil and then maybe put some wet leaves on top. 
So you don't want the soil to dry out. And you're trying to replicate the natural environment as much as you can. Yeah, absolutely. So Patricia's kids have said that you can take cuttings from willow too. You absolutely can. In fact, one thing that, that you can bring into the holly cuttings is, and the reason that willow works so well for cuttings is that it has incredible rooting powers. So it has two different chemical compounds in it. Those chemical compounds, one of them prevents disease, getting in a, a cut, and the other one allows it to, to re-root very easily. So if you want to, what you can do is, if Patricia's kids know where there's willow, maybe they can share with everyone else. Um, you want to find some willow stems, cut them up into about inch long um, sections, fill a bucket with boiling water and leave the willow, the cut up bits of willow in that overnight. And then any cuttings that you take from any other tree, like the holly for instance, you can soak them in the willow water and that'll, it, it uses, it kind of has the same effect as a rooting powder that you might have traditionally used um, from gardening. So some organic gardeners don't like using rooting powder, but they do use willow water. And if you don't have either of those things, you can just chance putting the holly, the holly in by itself. All right, perfect. So there's another one popped in there. How long does it take the holly to start to grow? So I would leave it a year without disturbing it. So once you put the cutting in the pot or in the trench, you want to find a shady spot. It's not going to dry out and it's not going to be disturbed or walked over. And for the roots, it takes a couple of months for the roots to start coming out. So it needs to have the cold winter first and that will um, kind of prevent disease and things. And then in the springtime, you'll get the first roots coming out of it. They're very easily damaged if they're moved. So I would just allow it to root into the soil for the first year anyway, and then see if, it, if you feel like moving it. Um, another reason that I'd say that cuttings are easier is that um, the berries, I can show you later when we're after the break, to stratify, it's called to stratify a holly uh, seed from the berry, you have to put it in a bucket of water take this the berry off it and then scratch it to, to basically replicate what it's, what's happening in a bird's stomach. And even after that, it can take 18 months for it to get to a stage of shooting. So <laughs> the cuttings are quicker, even though it's still taking a long time. Things don't happen the quickly. The patient for game that started, <laughs> starting a holly tree from a seed, it sounds like a very patient <laughs> game to play. <laughs> a life's work, but worth yeah. it. And the great thing about them is that they, they survive anywhere. They survive in very poor soil and in conditions that you wouldn't imagine a tree could possibly live in. If you've ever been in the Gap of Dunlow and definitely any, any rock climbers that, are, that have been around the Gap of Dunlow or anywhere else in Ireland, you have often used a holly bush that's sticking out of the side of a, a vertical cliff face and it's just managed to, to get a root in there and hang on. So they're very tenacious. What do the holly seeds look like? Um, so actually I have some holly berries out the back garden and I can show you what they look like when I take them out of the berry. Um, what I'll do first is I will just give you a little rundown on the different areas of trees in Killarney and why, why they're like that. And then we'll go and have a 10 minute break and then we'll, we'll go through the seeds of holly. So just wanted to say to give a little bit more information on the area we're actually discussing. In the biosphere, the reason there's such diversity in the biosphere is that, again, it comes back to the rock. So originally, we, if you can imagine it, in the far, far distant past, we were <laughs> a tropical, tropical nation. So <laughs> we lived, um, well, we personally didn't live, but Ireland's rocks were a shallow tropical sea and the sand in that sea um, solidified to become sandstone rock. And it's called the Devonian era when this happened. So that sand was compacted over time to give a very hard wearing rock called sandstone. And we have a couple of different types, but mostly in Kerry, it's old red sandstone. Up at the top of Muckris Lake, you can see some green ones and older ones, but mainly it's, it's old red sandstone that we have. So that was the oldest rock and that was the underlying, that's what underlines everything in this area. And then we have a fault line 
where thousands of years later, we have the production of limestone rock on top of it. So limestone rock is a carboniferous rock. It's, if people who know about dinosaurs, these are the, the different eras. <laughs> the carboniferous era was when the limestone was put down. And limestone is a very different type of rock. So if you have ever been to the burn, you know that it's very sharp, very prickly. You don't want to be sitting on a limestone crag all day, let me tell you. And um, it's very pointy and sharp and brittle. So it, it does break easily, but it's got lots of interesting features. On the other hand, the sandstone is quite smooth, but gritty because it's made of sand. Um, and in the middle of the lakes of Killarney, we have a fault line between those two rock types. So basically they were crushed together. And you have on one side, you have the old red sandstone. And on the other, you have outcroppings of this limestone rock. And you can tell the difference from the trees that are around. So like we've gone through, you have the sessile oak that likes acid, the acidic soils. You have the holly that often grows in the understory of those areas as well. And then you have aspen in the mountainous areas. And none of those are, are covering some of the most famous trees in Killarney though, because those trees grow on limestone areas and they're yew. So yew trees, I haven't mentioned and I haven't given a video on because there are no native trees. There are some, there are some uh, golf course yew trees around here, but, <laughs> but not the proper ones that are in Killarney area. So I won't, um, you, have to, you have to see them to believe them really. So on Inish Fallon and around Ross Castle, there are some immense yew trees. And those yew trees grow on, um, on shallow soils on top of limestone rocks. So they prefer more alkaline soils. And those yew trees, some of them have been around since before the last ice age. They're the only, the only trees that we have that were here before the ice age. And it's just because they lived in a little gap between two glaciers that were converging like this. The yews were in the middle and the descendants of those yews are still there today. So everything else has come in since in waves across from, from Europe when we still were joined to Europe by land. And then when the, when the water rose up and cut off those land bridges, what, the, what trees were here are native trees. So the yews are still there on, uh, around the Killarney area. If you go on, if, if you go on a kayak tour, not that I would know anything about that, <laughs> but um, from sailing around the lakes of Killarney on a kayak, you certainly get up with close and personal with the yew trees on those islands because they are hanging on to what looks like bare rock sometimes. And they're massive trees, um, but yet yeah, they prefer limestone rock. And even around Killarney town, you can still see some yew trees. Um, I know that um, um, if you're coming from Tralee into Killarney, um, uh, I think Hansleeve are roundabout. There are a pair of massive yew trees on just past that road. So you can see them all around the town even. Um, so just keep an eye out. And next time you see a yew tree, remember that that's come from the rock and everything that we see has as well. So as well as that, um, we have the effects of glaciation in this area. So we had 15,000 years ago, we had the last ice age was kind of receding and um, a glacier, a massive, massive glacier tore down through, um, through the Killarney area, creating the lakes. So it, it ripped like fingers through sand. Imagine your fingers tearing through sandstone um, is what the glaciers did. And as they moved down from the upper lake, down to Muckris Lake and then to Loch Lane, they kind of lost momentum. So they spread out, the glacier spread out and melted. So it cut less deep when it was creating Loch Lane, but much wider. And you can see as well in the gap of Dunlow, the same glaciers tearing through very, very high side walls. And then at the bottom of the gap of Dunlow near Kate Kearney's cottage, let's say, you have what are called moraines. So moraines are a really cool thing where a glacier drops off all of the soil that it's carried and it leaves it like in a, a ditch essentially. So it looks like a hill now, small hills at the bottom of the gap, but in ancient times they were important because they had more fertile soil than any of the surrounding area. So if you were during famine times, 
struggling to feed yourself and you knew that moraines had better soil because they've been dragged there by a glacier, then you can use those for planting potatoes, say, which can grow in acidic soils. And that's why we focus too much on the potato in those times, because it did actually suit the soil that we have. So you can still see lazy beds, which are where people used to grow potatoes in the moraines at the bottom of the gap, I don't know. So just, it's another example of how the rock type dictates how people behave as well as trees. Okay, so I think we're gonna have a little break. Um, so I'll give everyone 10 minutes and I'm just going to um, take the computer outside and we'll get set up for planting some holly. Fantastic, relocate yourself, that's great. So <laughs> yeah. to take a quick break, go and stretch your legs, do a little dance, do something to <laughs> get the blood flowing again and we'll see you in a few minutes. anyone still watching if you have any questions do remember to throw them into the chat box or into the Q&A and we'll try and get Alana to answer them. I know there was one that came in previously that I haven't got to yet about Japanese not with an ivy but I think Alana covered a lot of the ivy stuff when she was talking about ivy earlier which was fantastic. Oh, I see we have one question come in there in the q and I will make sure I ask that of Alana when she comes back to us. 
I'm just going to launch a quick poll there with a few questions about what trees you have close to you or if you have native trees in your garden or if you plan to plant native trees in your garden. So when you pop back in, you can answer that. Or if you're still watching, you can answer now, of course. Another question there from Breed. Thanks, Breed. Again, I'll uh, pin Alana down when she comes back in. Anyone has any other questions? Do keep dropping them in. Alana's just resetting herself up. So in the next section, she's going to be in her garden. Here we have Alana joining us again. So, Hello. hi, how's it going, Alana? <laughs> like a, a relocated. <laughs> so, just let me know if I go out of frame at any time because um, it might be perfect. Moving. Just before you get started, there, there's a question popped in in the Q and A here. How tall can an ash tree grow? I think they can grow to about forty foot on occasion. I think the foot. highest one in Ireland. The highest one in Ireland is 40 foot, as far as I'm aware, usually about 20 feet. Fantastic. And then there's another question that's popped in about cherry blossoms. Why do cherry blossoms bloom at different times of the year? Sometimes they seem to bloom late and sometimes early. What's the reason for that, do you know? I don't know, to be quite honest with you. There are a couple of different cherries. There's bird cherry, and then I think there's an ornamental cherry that might be and um, that might have been brought in by people. So unless they're different, um, the different species blossom at different times, that's that's my only guess. I, I honestly can't answer for sure. Sorry. And then one last one that just relates to what you just did with the holly tree. Can you take cuttings from a mountain ash like you took from the holly? Um, it's not well known for doing that. But I don't see any reason why not to try at this time of year. And um, as far as I'm aware, there's no reason why it wouldn't work. It's just not, not well known for it as far as I'm Lovely stuff. And ju just while you were just while you were popping into the garden there, we did a quick poll to see what trees people have in their garden or close to them. So there's a huge amount of people with holly trees, ash, alder, and hazel. So all of our nice native trees. 
And most people are hoping to grow native trees in their garden after watching this workshop, which is great. And 78% of the people watching have already got native trees in their garden. So okay, that is so great to hear. <laughs> so well done everyone who already has. And I hope this does give you some more information if, if there's something that you didn't know before. It's always hard to gauge when you don't know who's going to be at a workshop and how experienced people are. So hopefully if you are a total beginner or a bit more advanced, even more so than myself maybe, I hope there's been something in it for you. So um, we might just go ahead with this, with this kind of practical side of things. Um, so there's a couple of different things that I'm going to do today. So a couple of different activities that you can do in your lockdown area. And um, one of them, the first one is going to be to make leaf mold. So this is again a long-term process. Nothing happens quickly with trees, but it is worth it. So what I did is I bought some wire. You can get a, you can get a roll of this for a tenner in a hardware shop. And I just folded it in half because I want less gaps in between the, the mesh. And then essentially I'm just making it into a cylinder. So all it takes is to roll it up like this and then bend the wires in. I used the pliers to cut it. So maybe if there's an adult that does the, the cutting at first, that'd be good. The reason that I'm using a mesh like this, rather than just a container, is that leaf mold needs to breathe. So if you imagine tree leaves that fall to the forest floor, they're not kept in a compost bin with, with no air. They have air circulating the whole time. And another difference is between normal compost and leaf compost is that um, bacteria break down what's in a compost bin. So if you have, for instance, grass and things, they're quite wet. And that wetness means that bacteria will break them down eventually. Whereas with leaf litter, you want the fungi that are on the leaves already to do the breaking down. So what I'm making here is just a little container that's like a basket for leaf litter. And I can put it down like this on the ground, or if you want to make a base for it, then if you're going to be moving it, you can do that as well. So that's all it takes. This is only a small one for my garden because it's not a huge garden. And I don't have a huge amount of large trees in it, although the oak up there is doing its best to, to cover the place. So I collected, collected these leaves in a plastic bag. And essentially, I'm just going to throw them all in there for, for breaking down. And I'm just giving this as an example of something that you can do at home as an activity with your children or something. It takes a long time for these to break down. If you just leave them in a shady spot once you've made the basket, in two years, you'll have the ideal medium for planting trees in. So you can go out and gather a little bit in, in woodlands nearby. Don't take a lot. Don't take it from the National Park because we're not supposed to transfer things in and out of the National Park. But um, if you have any trees in your garden already, collect those leaves and make use of them. It is well worthwhile separating them from your normal compost because they're so, so good for growing trees later. So that is just one activity. Next one is planting the seeds. So we're planting the cuttings. So here I have my male holly stem. There's another one that still has the leaves on it, but I find that to just totally strip the leaves off it is better for it to conserve water. So that's what I do. I bought a bag of sand for 350 in a hardware shop as well. So it's not going to break the bank to do these activities. I've just filled it up with about two inches of sand in this pot. And let's just play sand. So I filled all these pots with that. And then here is a mixture of soil and leaf mold. So the leaf compost that I made before. If I didn't have any of that, I would just use ordinary compost on top of the sand. And then on top of this, I'm going to put some leaf litter. So 
Sam, you want to move that? Okay, and just to show you for demonstration purposes, at the bottom of the stem, you can see that, there's a side shoot and this, the bottom of it is a straight cut across. So you want that for pushing down into the soil. And then at the top, it's a diagonal cut. Can you see that? And you want to make sure that that's a diagonal cut. I can even do it again just to, just to sharpen it up a bit more. The reason you want a diagonal cut at the top is that it helps the rain just run down the sides of the stem. If rain gathers in the kind of flat basin at the top, if you put it straight across, it will cause fungus and it will cause rot to get into the top of your stem. So diagonal at the top and straight across the bottom. And then all I do is push it down the side of the, push it down the side of the pot, like a bit of support. And the other reason is that the holes are around the edges of the pot and you want the most drainage you possibly can. So that's why you're going for the edge. I push it right down until it's nearly at the bottom. Here is my female. I'm just going to cut off the side branches of this. There's different opinions as to what's better to leave the leaves on or not to leave the leaves on. So I'm perfectly open. People say that they've heard that it can be done better with leaves on. Absolutely fine. I might even leave them on this one. I've taken the berries off because if I leave the berries on, it'll be ripped out by birds. Um, I might just take off another few so it can go down the side of the pot. Now, since I've cut this, these cuttings, um, they have been soaking in water and then in willow water. So I just want to keep them wet at the bottom. I don't want them to dry out. If you let them dry out, they're not going to be successful usually. So once I've cleared off enough to stick it down into the ground, I'm just going to push it down into the opposite side of the pot here to the male. And now I'm going to label them. I'm not going to do it on the camera, but I will label them. But this is the female and this is the male, just in case you want to remember where, where you want the berries in your garden. You want to put the female one there. Okay, so they are the cuttings. And in fact, one more thing that I should have said is to put wet leaves on the top. It's going to spread them over the top. They'll break down over the year and they'll also pre prevent the, the soil from drying out. So that's the great thing about leaf litter, it really keeps the moisture in there. Okay, so that's the cuttings. Now, This is an old tin. I've already um, made charcoal from willow in this. That's why it's all black. Um, that's an activity for another day. Okay, the berries. So I'm actually just going to grab a bowl of water. So I'll be out of the camera for a second. Here we go. So I have a bowl of water and a sieve. So I'm putting the sieve down so that it fills somewhat with water. A little shot there. We'll try it here and hope this doesn't overbalance. So what I'm doing is scraping the holly berry off the bottom of the sieve. The water just loosens it a little bit and then I can use my nails to peel back the the flesh of the egg. I can come in here. Okay, 
So So there's four seeds inside. They're kind of yellow color. Okay, so I just dispose of the of the seed of the of the red fleshy part and I'll leave it out for for birds to have. Okay. Now if you can see the seeds there. So those are holly seeds. Even still, they're protected from germinating straight away because if they were passing through the stomach of a bird, they would be ground up a little bit. So I put them inside the sieve. I'll do it outside the water just so that you can see. I'm just rubbing the seed off the bottom of the sieve. Just roughing it up a bit. Okay, once I've done that with all the seeds, I want to place them into sand. And it's called stratifying them. Bag of sand again, I'm not going to heave that across. Now I take the holly seeds and spread them out on top of the sand. Yeah, there's a question just in from Patricia saying, are souls, I think, are souls the same as the holly? They are. There's a lot of different seeds that need to be stratified like this. And it just means it's replicating what they would have done on the forest floor. So they might not have germinated straight away, we're just staying in the wet, damp environment in the cold over winter for months. And then another year even goes by and they have another winter and then they start germinating. So all I'm going to do is keep that tin with the seeds in it. Any other seeds that you want to put in it, you can do several different varieties of plants like this. Just put little labels on the sides of the tin. You want to have holes in the bottom of the tin. I should have said that at the start. So sorry if you've already started with your tin, but make holes in the underneath of it, put a little bit of water in, put the seeds on top, on the sand, and then you just put the lid, put the lid on the tin and keep it under a bench or somewhere sheltered for the year. Check on it every couple of weeks or every couple of months just to make sure that the sand hasn't totally dried out and they'll be happy out there in the tin. And then year after next, you take out your holly your holly seedlings and I, by then I would imagine that your your cuttings would be well on their way so that's why I use that method but just out of interest this is how you would this is how you would do those type of things okay. and then there's one more thing that I'm going to do and that is plant some hazelnuts so the hazelnuts that I have are just over here Sorry, now this is what comes from being in the garden, having to take stuff in and out because of the rain. So I forgot to say that these ash keys are another one that can be stratified in the tin with the holly. So once they've gone brown like this, you want to put them in to stratify. If they were green still when they fell, or if you took them off the tree green, then you could plant them straight away. But because they've gone into this state, they'll be dormant. So they need to be put in, in the tin to stratify. So in half the tin, I'm just going to place these ash keys and hopefully they'll take off as well. Okay. Okay, 
Now these, this is just kitchen roll and I wet the kitchen roll first and then I put it, I filled it with the seeds that I found, the hazel. I'm in the opening of it now is the challenge. The reason I kept them in wet kitchen roll like this is that you don't want the seeds to dry out. If you let them dry out, they're just no longer going to be viable. So if you're going collecting anything that's, um, that, that you can plant straight away, so the hazelnuts and the acorns, for instance, they need to be kept damp. So I just find kitchen roll is a handy way to do it. Another way is if you filled a paper bag or something or a canvas bag with wet leaf litter and keep them in there with the leaf litter because that would be their, their normal state. So here we go. Right, so I had some that are still attached to their little seed case. The hazels. So I'm going to plant them straight away into, again, sand at the end of, of pot, soil in on top of that, leaf mold if you have it, and leaf litter on top. So I fill that up with the soil. Right? Sorry, I didn't want to drag a massive bag of soil across the yard. So I put in the soil here. That's a mixture of compost and leaf mold that I collected earlier. It's in on top of the sand. Then I'm going to place these about an inch deep into this. So put them in on their sides. See this. Push them in on their sides. I separated them. I'd fit three or four in the one pot because you don't know if some of them are not going to work out. If they start sprouting, then you can start separating them later. This one here is an acorn. So I'm not actually going to plant that because I'm surrounded by oak here already. But go for it if you don't, if you don't have oak in your area. Some more hazelnuts. Again, just pushing them down an inch deep into the soil. And then I pat down the soil on top. And then again, leaf litter in on top. This is some partially broken down leaf mold. We've just had a question pop in there, Alana, about the leaf litter. Does it matter if the likes of laurel or non-native evergreen leaves get mixed up with the deciduous ones when you're collecting it? Or do you have to be really careful and just get your deciduous leaves in your leaf litter? Um, it depends on the area. So if you think that there might be spores from an invasive species in there, like if it's in the middle of a a load of red, rhododendron or, or knotweed, then I wouldn't take that leaf litter. I just find an area where there, where there aren't any invasive species that you don't want. When it's something like just, um, if it's just the odd laurel leaf and you have laurel in your garden and it's just the leaves, um, I wouldn't mind that so much. It just, the, the laurel is not going to break down in the same way that a native tree would. Laurel is more like a holly leaf. It's a waxy coated leaf. So it doesn't it doesn't kind of get that wet floppy look like a like an oak leaf would, for instance. So I, it wouldn't put me off using it, but I would try to avoid areas that have invasive species to if I was going to plant in my own garden. Um, so the last thing you would do with, with this then is to protect it from 
uh, being eaten. So if you've gone to all this effort to collect a couple of seeds for yourself and you're planting them in your garden, you do not want them pulled out by crows even, who can find acorns anywhere, or squirrels or mice. So what I would do is put some of the, of the wire mesh that we already had, I would put that over this just to cover it. Make sure the holes aren't big enough for, for mice to get in. And um, if you don't have any of that mesh, literally anything will do. Try, if you have an old grill or something lying around, you can put that over it, or a plastic bag with holes in it, of course, comes from works. And I'd leave that on for a couple of months and put it in a shady spot and leave it be, let it do its thing. So there are the activities that we have for today. And I hope that there's something you learned or that you might like to try at home. Um, is there any other questions that I can help anyone with? Great. So thank you so much, Alana. I feel like I have learned a huge amount from you today. I'm like, I need to be taking notes throughout it so that I can remember all of the little details about the native <laughs> trees that we have and how to keep looking after them as well, which was really cool. And we do have a comment from Patricia here again. She said, every year we plant ash trees at Easter. That's from Patricia's kids. So oh, these guys are amazing with their tree planting. <laughs> yeah, we should get them to run a workshop actually. <laughs> and because it's really important that it's done by everyone. So even in your own area, Patricia's kids, wherever you are, if you want to share what you know with other kids around in the area or with your school, just say it to them that you can, you can show photos of what you've done or anything. And it might inspire some other people that you know. That's all we can do. Fantastic. Yeah, that, that's the best thing we can do, I think, is keep sharing the, the knowledge, the information and the enthusiasm is important as well. Um, we don't have any other questions coming in at the minute. Uh, if anyone does have any, we have a few comments. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, fantastic presentation. So really positive comments. I just have one last um, poll that I was going to run. Oh, that wrong one. Well, too. Uh, a few more thanks. Lovely workshop. Really enjoyed it. Thanks from Anita McEwen. And Elsa O'Connor has said thank you as well. Uh, Patricia Holbin, thank you, Eleanor and Alana. Definitely more Alana than me. <laughs> thanks to Alana for all the work. Couldn't um, have had brilliant me. presentation and workshop. A lot of effort and information. And thank you so Actually, much from everyone. So brilliant stuff. I think just before we finish up, because I just saw um, a guide that I had left out because I know that it's coming up um, to Christmas and if people are looking for presents for other people and you've no idea what to get and you're looking for maybe thinking of a, a present of a book or something or something for someone, I can really recommend these guides because you, you learn so much just from practicing things, these things by yourself. This is a tree guide. It comes from the Field Studies Council. So on their website, the Field Studies Council, you can buy these guides. You can buy a set of five. One of them is about mini beasts. One of them is flowers. One of them is trees. And it's a really great way to, to get to know things better yourself because just no one has all the answers. And um, no one has all the answers, but if you, um, if you can figure it out yourself, figure out a problem yourself, the learning is twice, is sticks twice as much. So just when the camera comes back on, I'll show you what this looks like again. Another book you can get is the Collins Complete Guide to Irish Wildlife. It's an absolutely fantastic book. Just if you want a one-stop shop for everything, for all Irish species, it's absolutely brilliant. The pictures are great in it. Just to have in a house, to share between everyone it's great if you see a bird in the garden and you don't know what it is just take that off the shelf it's fantastic so i've actually just dropped a link in there into the chat um for the uh, the Field Studies um, Council have a website where you can buy the, the study, the books that Alana was just mentioning there. And then Eason's have a copy of the Complete Irish Guide, or the Complete Guide to Irish Wildlife. Um, but I'm sure most local bookstores would probably have that one. I know it's it's a quite a popular one. Okay. And we have a few questions just come in there, Alana. Um, can we buy hazel? Yeah, there are lots of garden centres that you can buy hazel from. Um, definitely. 
Um, I know that there there is a garden centre out towards, I think between Kilardlin and Glen Bay that sells it. Um, but honestly, I can't I can't say more than that. But usually, if you go to a tree nursery, um, just look up tree tree nurseries in your area, and and get them. Make sure that it's that they're grown in Ireland because sometimes garden centres can um, can grow trees abroad up to saplings, up to the, the age of a sapling, and then they import them in and sell them in Ireland. And it was planting saplings that had been grown in, in the Netherlands that brought ash dye back into the country. So just make sure to check with your garden centre or tree nursery that, they have, that they've come from Ireland. Also because, like I said earlier, if a, if a tree has come from an area and grown well there, it's a sign that it'll do well in your garden too. So um, I might we be have able one to more question here as well, Alana. Um, do, you, do you do any face-to-face -face workshops or in-person visits? So where, where that's from Sally Ann, she's wondering, where can she see you again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I absolutely do in-person workshops. That's, that's my usual <laughs> MO. This is the first time actually that I've done an online workshop like this. So thanks everyone for bearing with me through the technology and all of that. Um, but yeah, usually I do experiential education workshops and tours. And um, if you want to email me, my email address is alananikali at gmail.com and we can talk about whatever type of workshop or, or session you'd like to run. Um, and I work with schools and I also work with private groups as well. I think actually everyone should have your email. I think I sent an email out earlier today to all of the attendees this morning or this afternoon, I should say. Um, so you should have it. It's alananikali at gmail, but you should already have it in your inbox somewhere. I, I've just had a quick poll running um, about some feedback for the workshop, Alana, and we have 100% of people thinking the workshop was great. And the only comments we asked, how would you improve this workshop? And most people want to have it outside with you in person. So <laughs> I think that would be your preferred medium as well. But, um, just thank you so much for... Oh. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for putting it together today. I know that it was... Uh, a big ask, I think. Everyone's sort of like having to jump online and it's not really where we're probably most comfortable, but I think it was fantastic. And thank you so much for all the work today. And thanks to everyone for listening in. And um, if anyone wants to join us, we've got two more talks next Wednesday and the Wednesday after. You can check the Facebook page for those. And there's Alana's email there as well. So if you want to get in touch with Alana directly, email her any of your questions or if you want to request workshops, you work with primary schools, secondary schools, community groups, all kinds of people. So I think the more people that know the stuff Alana knows, the better. So definitely get in touch and plan ahead for more workshops. Thanks very much for having me, everyone. It's been really nice seeing this. So thanks for coming. <laughs> Great stuff. So we'll leave it there. I'm going to end the webinar and thanks very much for everyone and enjoy the rest of your day.